trying to hammer out some final technical issues here. All right, well, welcome everybody. Apologies for the slight gap at the beginning here. Uh, one of my goals today, among many others, because this is a, a very busy period, there's a lot going on that I want to cover, uh, both on the science side and otherwise. Uh, the likelihood of some high impact weather in California uh, within the next week has greatly increased. Uh, 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 through uh, through mid next week, uh, and I wanted to reflect a little bit also on what these sessions uh, mean uh, for uh, those who are consuming them, and sort of my my day in these sessions can be used uh, more broadly because there has been uh, some some interesting experiences that have resulted from some some. Uh, uh, mischaracterizations, uh, shall I say, of some things that we've been talking about. Uh, one technical in the past few weeks may have noticed uh, in recent weeks that since uh, since we moved to a new house, the connection on uh, interruptions, and I spent a lot of the day yesterday in the crawl space, uh, the Xfinity technician replacing a bunch of old wiring issue, but just based on the number of interruptions that have already occurred in the three minutes uh, since I started streaming, uh, that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of interruptions right now. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, somehow it seems even worse uh, than it was before. So uh, pretty clearly wasn't that old wiring. Um, uh, the OBS software in particular. Obviously not going to address that right now during the live stream, but please do contact me offline. Uh, the resolution may yet be uh, getting another machine. All right, you know what I'm going to do since uh, most folks are telling me that they essentially uh, cannot see or hear me. I'm going to briefly return uh, in a, a different program setting. So please bear with me. Uh, I'm going to return. The stream may briefly pause for up to about two minutes. I should be on again shortly. Thank you for your patience.
Okay, how about now? How about audio now? Uh, good? Good? Acceptable? Uh, I'll take acceptable today after all this. I know it's been about a, a half hour of... Uh, all right, getting some affirmatives. So long story is I have no idea why that was happening. One thing I noticed is that Adobe Creative Cloud was taking up 99.8% of the CPU despite not being uh, uninstall it or temporarily turn it off. So um, what's the difference between that and a computer virus again? I don't know. But I think a lot of these uh, cloud software packages are designed to run on unfortunately much more uh, huh, much more sophisticated machines. I guess to me a 2018 MacBook does not seem like an old computer, but I guess these days that's ancient history. Got to work on a budget for a new one. Stay tuned for that. But I really just don't think I can fix it. After spending the day in the in the crawl space yesterday, I don't think it's the internet connection. Uh, and after this experience right now, I'm nearly certain of the case. So anyway, uh, I don't want to belabor the point too much. It actually, ironically, looks like the connection now is pretty good. So <laughs> I'll take it. All right, well, amazingly, there are still uh, 200 people watching. I can only imagine how many people would have been watching uh, <laughs> on this one had I not spent half an hour trying to troubleshoot my hard drive. But anyway, uh, thanks for your persistence. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you today, and I'll, and I'll just extend this one, I guess. Uh, it was already probably going to be an extra long office hour session. Um, probably longer than an hour, probably more like 90 minutes. Uh, might be slightly shorter than 90 minutes with this delay now, but it's still gonna be over an hour since I got a lot I wanna cover. So thanks again uh, for your support and sticking with me and hopefully the connection holds. Yeah, as I say this, ironically, it hasn't interrupted in, in the whole my whole spiel just now. So I will get started. Uh, there is a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of ground I wanna to cover today. Uh, first, briefly, I want to uh, offer some uh, brief, like less than five minute additional thoughts on what happened in Maui and how the conversation about what has happened on Maui has evolved in interesting and, and somewhat problematic, I think, directions. But I want to spend the majority of this uh, conversation focused back on California because there actually is quite a lot going on. Uh, already this week, we've been seeing bouts of uh, pockets a pretty significant thunderstorm activity, some of which been associated with dry lightning or dry enough lightning to spark fires in various places, uh, particularly in the northern third of the state and in northwestern California uh, in, in particular. So there, there has been something of a lightning a fire bust up in interior northwestern California in the last 24 to 36 hours. There was a bunch of new fire starts, most of which are still small, and aren't doing too much yet, but a few of which have really taken off, have burned some thousands of acres, and there are evacuations. So uh, that's an important part of the conversation. There will be additional thunderstorm activity across the northern third to about the northern half of California over the next uh, 48 hours. In fact, the round this evening into tomorrow could even affect parts of the Bay Area, in particular the North Bay. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'll be talking current active pattern with thunderstorms and wildfires uh, ongoing in Northern California. The potentially even bigger story uh, moving into early next week is going to be the potential uh, for, I was originally, even when I scheduled this, uh, when I scheduled this live stream, was thought I would be talking about the remnants of a tropical system moving into Southern California potentially. That's something that happens every couple of years. That's unusual, but not rare. Uh, but now uh, that still even happen is a little bit uh, beyond that, where there is at least a small chance that a largely intact, weakening but intact, uh, tropical cyclone or post-tropical cyclone uh, may make a very close approach uh, on Southern California uh, Sunday into Monday. And I really want to spend the bulk of the time today talking about that. Uh, because the impacts could be very high. This is unlikely to be, at this point, just a nuisance event and could actually produce some major impacts, but potentially also surf and even wind. This is not typical for August, 
uh, in any part of California. So this is going to be a fairly big deal. Uh, this would be with uh, now developing Hurricane Hillary in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So I'm going to talk about that as well. So I wanted to start, uh, go back to the beginning and briefly do my five minutes uh, on what has unfolded in Maui and the wildfire catastrophe there. The, just to summarize, uh, the, the death toll there is now over 100, making it the deadliest wildfire in modern North American history, so really in the last century. So it, it is sobering that this has happened on one of the tropical uh, islands uh, in the Hawaiian chain. That is remarkable, and yet not really that surprising to those who study wildfire uh, on the Pacific Islands, uh, especially in the modern era, because there has been uh, more fire in Hawaii in recent decades, and the reasons for that are various, but include the legacy of problematic land management policies, uh, different problematic land management policies than the rest of the, the continental western U.S., but land management nonetheless, in this case, it's the abandonment of large agricultural plantations and the overgrowth of very dense and tall tropical grasses that provide a lot of fuel that wouldn't have otherwise been there uh, in a natural ecosystem in that, part of the, in that part of the world, and also climate change. And I really do want to talk about that latter part, even though it may or may not be uh, the dominant factor in, in, in this conversation. And that's because uh, in the last conversation, I, went, I took a bit of a deep dive into the details of the Maui disaster as it unfolded, uh, and the meteorological causes, at least in a proximal sense, the violent downslope windstorm, the moderate to severe drought that was in place uh, prior to that point. And, you know, at the end, talked about how I didn't think that it, in, the, in the universe of this particular event, wasn't the clearest example of the, the increasingly obvious links between wildfire and climate change, broadly speaking. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there are no links at all. In fact, uh, the literature on and wildfire, it is much sparser, to be fair, than the literature on, say, California wildfires and climate change, or North American uh, wildfires and climate change more generally, uh, over the continent. But there is some research on, on the, how the changes in precipitation patterns on the dry versus the wet side of the islands, and of course the overall warming trend, is likely to increase the, the preconditions necessary for wildfire on the leeward side, or the dry side of the Hawaiian Islands. And of course, the, the fire on Maui that was so devastating did occur in exactly such an environment, on the dry side of the island in the middle of an unusually dry period. So of course the summer is still the dry period on the dry side uh, of the Hawaiian Islands, but this particular event occurred under conditions that were even drier than would normally be the case. And I did want to remind folks just briefly what a conversation was uh, with the live stream, and I'm actually going to read a direct quote uh, from my own live stream because I thought it would be uh, appropriate given the way that the uh, sentence that followed uh, later in the conversation has been uh, misused a little bit in recent days. But, and I think folks who are on this live stream listening who are on the wildfire side of things will appreciate this. This is almost a multi-purpose kind of statement about thinking about and talking about wildfire these days in the public sphere. And this is the quote from that previous call, which is, wildfire disasters are always extremely complex events, and there's a tendency to oversimplify uh, the complexity that is inherent to them uh, in almost every setting in which they're discussed. And so what I really want to push back against uh, is the need to have these singular sound bites. And I understand that people's attention spans are short uh, in the information age, uh, but this is something you really cannot get right unless you do dig into the details. And so uh, that's what I try to do uh, in these long-form YouTube conversations. What that means is, among other things, that you're getting a, a little bit of an unmoderated stream of consciousness. You know, usually when you see a television interview, um, the person doing the interviewing and the interviewee uh, are really focused on getting a very specific message out quickly uh, using short, succinct sentences and sound bites. 
really getting to uh, the point as fast as possible. These YouTube conversations are inherently a little bit more meandering, and I think a lot of folks appreciate that because it allows, well, first of all, it allows uh, for uh, to me to get into a lot more depth on a range of topics, but it also means you get my unvarnished thoughts. Uh, and sometimes that means that you're going to hear me say things that probably could have been phrased better. But it also means that you really do have to listen to the whole conversation to understand the broader context of what I'm talking about. And there are probably any number of individual sentences that you could pull out of these conversations uh, and, and, and use them in ways that make it sound like I'm actually saying the opposite of what I'm truly trying to convey. And so I don't think folks do that on purpose in this context. It certain happened to me, certainly happened to me uh, before where it's obviously intentional. And I don't really mean to call anyone out or any news outlets out in particular in having this discussion, but I did just want to reflect a bit on the fact that having uh, these very long form and unscripted live conversations, again, the, you know, I'm speaking with all of you live, uh, answering questions uh, for over an hour uh, every week, uh, and I don't have a script. I don't generally have prepared remarks beyond the the broad topics that I want to talk about. So that does uh, th th hopefully mean that there is a little bit of a mutual understanding that, uh, that that you really do have to listen to more than just one or two minutes of the conversation in this in this setting. I, I do speak differently in this venue than I do. Uh, when I'm, say, uh, on a 30-second spot on the BBC or on CNN or something, because the, the audience is different, but more importantly, the format is different. And obviously, there's some technical reasons why uh, live streaming is difficult, but there are also uh, some, some other reasons why that can be challenging, too. So I just wanted to emphasize one thing, uh, finally, before I move on to California regarding what happened in Maui. There's never any singular cause for any complex disaster, and this is m doubly true, I think, for wildfire disasters, because these have almost always a confluence of factors that range uh, from the ecology of a region, the meteorology of a region, and also the societal uh, vulnerability and the history, even, of that region. Have we suppressed natural fires? Have we made indigenous and cultural burning illegal? Is there a legacy of agricultural plantations, as was the case in Hawaii? How was a town developed? Is it sprawling into the wildlands? Is it concentrated at the core? Are there good evacuation routes? What is the ratio of short-term visitors versus people who know the road networks well? All of that is important and was certainly relevant in what happened on Maui. But all of that is, is a little bit difficult to quantify, especially in the moment. And so when we have conversations about how climate change is affecting wildfires, it's not to say that those other things aren't important. In fact, it's not to say that some of these other things may even be more important than climate change, depending on the context. But climate change is still there. And in some cases, it may be lurking in the background uh, as a as a relatively modest aggravating factor, and that may be true for what happened on Maui. But in other cases, it really might be prominent in the foreground as the main story. And increasingly, in some places like the forests of California and the boreal forests in Canada, which have each, in recent years, experienced similar levels of wildfire catastrophes, I think climate change is a much more obvious uh, part of the picture, right at the forefront. So there are clear links between wildfire and climate change generally. The strength of that connection does vary from place to place and event to event. There is evidence that climate change is making the dry side of the Hawaiian Islands increasingly susceptible to wildfire. But there are a lot of other things happening on the Hawaiian Islands that don't have to do with climate change that are also increasing that risk. So with that, I think I'm going to leave it there uh, and move on to California. Uh, because there is a whole lot of stuff going on. And I'm going to start at the beginning uh, chronologically with what has happened in the last 24 hours and then what we're going to see in the next day or so and then move on to the big event uh, probably slated for Sunday or Monday somewhere in that window. So over the past couple of days uh, we've seen 
moist uh, southerly to southeasterly flow. When we talk about uh, atmospheric winds, we talk about the direction from which the winds come, not, not the direction to which they're blowing. So uh, south winds means, or southeast winds mean winds from the south to southeast, so blowing from southeast to northwest broadly. Your mileage may vary locally, of course. But that broad flow has brought a lot of moist subtropical air along with some instability in the atmosphere over much of California. And there have been episodes of uh, isolated to scattered showers and thunderstorms all the way from the central coast a couple days ago this past weekend, uh, all the way up into the, the parts of the interior Bay Area and now especially in the northern interior of the state and the northwestern interior. So we're talking about the Trinity Alps, uh, the interior uh, Mendocino County, um, Tehama County mountains uh, and increase and also Shasta County. That's sort of where there have been the most lightning strikes and where there are also right now uh, the most fires. Right now it sounds like there are probably at least a couple dozen new lightning sparked ignitions in California plus some additional ones up in Oregon and in other states so western fire season has really picked up this week for sure. Uh, it's worth noting that British Columbia and Portland, Oregon also saw their all-time uh, hottest uh, August temperatures this week as well. So up there, uh, we're seeing record-breaking heat as well as dry lightning. In Northern California, we're merely seeing uh, very warm conditions along with that dry lightning. Not quite record-breaking in most cases, but still hotter than usual. So these fires are occurring in a context where uh, we're much drier than we were earlier in the summer. Most of the landscapes are now dry enough to support fire spread. It is still worth noting, though, that at higher elevations and in some of the river valleys, there is still more moisture than would usually be the case for this time of year because we did have an exceptionally wet winter and an unusually cool spring that followed it. So we are benefiting to some degree still from the legacy of those antecedent conditions. Now at lower elevations and on south facing slopes, it's pretty dry and the legacy of that wet winter and cool spring are fading away. But this may still help us as these fires uh, grow uh, beyond one uh, ridge line or, or, or one valley and start moving up and down the slopes. Uh, the, the, the rate of spread on the, on the cooler moisture side actually might be pretty inhibited still. Um, I would hope, at least in some regions, based on the antecedents that we have in place. So things are drying out. There have definitely been a lot of lightning ignitions. The landscape is definitely uh, receptive to additional lightning that we expect to see in the coming days. Even then, though, this does not look like an August 2020 repeat, despite some rumors. The level of lightning activity is much lower. The size and the behavior of the fires is smaller and less aggressive for the most part so far. I don't want to be too overconfident in that because we do have a few more days of hot temperatures and dry lightning to go. So we'll see what happens. And there will be an expanded region of lightning potential tonight, as I mentioned, potentially into the northern and eastern parts of the Bay Area uh, that haven't yet seen much lightning during this episode. So there could be some new fire starts in new places, and that can always be problematic with the gusty winds that come along with thunderstorms and the relatively poor overnight temperature recoveries we're seeing right now. So. Uh, I would expect to see a continued escalation in the wildfire situation across the northern third, maybe the northern half of California over the next 48 hours as hot temperatures continue. There's occasional isolated to scattered bouts of lightning, some of which may be dry, and also gusty winds associated with these forming and decaying thunderstorms. There have been some pretty impressive outflow boundaries generated by them. Uh, so far, they've been not too problematic because there weren't a lot of fires around for them to uh, push around, but now that there are some ignitions popping up and potentially additional holdover fires that are just smoldering there somewhere and may uh, become more active fire today or tomorrow, that becomes a bit more of a concern. So we are seeing more fire activity. There will be more hot weather and more thunderstorms to come, but it still doesn't look like August 2020. To be fair, that's a very high and traumatic bar for a lot of folks, so I'm glad that we're not having that conversation right now. But it's important to realize that there can still be some problems uh, even if we don't reach that level, which I'm not expecting that we will. So if that were the only thing we had to talk about, that would already be a pretty seeing lightning in parts of California that don't usually see it, uh, in, in, even near the coast uh, and in the Central Valley in some cases. Uh, so, but that's actually not the big story uh, today. And for those who've been following the weather over the past few days, 
In the blog post I wrote over the weekend, I mentioned that there was a potential for some remnant moisture from uh, one or two tropical systems to make their way into California between then and the end of August. Uh, then earlier this week, I mentioned that there was a rising chance of a more significant tropical moisture remnant event. Well, things have moved in a pretty interesting direction from there because in the last 36 hours, uh, there has been a convergence of model ensemble predictions suggesting that what is now tropical storm and will soon to become a hurricane, Hillary, with one L, uh, is going to make a pretty darn close approach on Southern California. And there was pretty high uncertainty regarding this uh, even yesterday, but there's been a remarkable consolidation in the range of potential tracks. Uh, and increasingly, both of the major global model ensembles, the American model, the GFS, and the European model, the ECMWF, and their respective ensembles, are starting to cluster on a solution that brings this tropical system uh, northwest, north-northwestward, right along the coast of northern Baja California. Where it goes thereafter is still subject to some uncertainty, but the plume is narrowing, and the likelihood that at least Southern California sees significant impacts from this tropical system are now probably greater than 50-50, so this is moving into more likely than not territory. What exactly do I mean by this? Well, essentially, for the first time that I can remember, there are a number of model ensemble members that suggest that the system will eventually become a major hurricane, so potentially peaking even as a Category 3 or Category 4 hurricane uh, as it moves up the coast of southern and central Baja California. Ocean surface temperatures off of southern Baja California are much warmer than average right now, anywhere from 2 to 4 degrees centigrade uh, or 3 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit above average, and that does provide extra hurricane, hurricane fuel. Water temperatures are only very slightly above average north of that, but the main point is that the genesis portion of the storm, where it's going to make, sort of accrue its strength, uh, the, the portion of the ocean while it's making that uh, traverse is significantly warmer than average, and so there's additional fuel. But the more important part is that there is going to be an unusual confluence of weather patterns across North America that is going to allow this tropical cyclone to be steered essentially towards Southern California, rather than recurving out into the open ocean as occurs with 95 or 98% uh, of the tropical storms that form off the coast of Mexico. This one's going to do something pretty unusual. It's going to move north-northwest until essentially it, reached, it reaches the Southern California Bight. And the reason for this is an unusually deep cutoff low to the west of California will induce some uh, flow from south to north over the central and northern parts of the state, but more importantly, a very strong and potentially record-breaking ridge of high pressure over the Midwest and Great Plains this week uh, that will likely bring a searing humid heat wave uh, to the Plains states in the Midwest, including Chicago, is going to act well like a, a river in a stream. And we're more used to talking about blocking ridges in winter, the ridiculously resilient ridge, if you recall. Uh, that alliterative um, air mass was essentially the proximal cause of California's major drought in the past decade, or droughts, perhaps, I should say. Well, this time, there's one setting up over the center of the country in summer. Normally, that wouldn't dramatically affect California weather, except that in this case, what it's going to do is deflect the jet stream and sort of cause a traffic jam in the flow pattern all across North America. And what it's going to do is prevent uh, the, the, the normal wind patterns from recurving this storm in the typical direction. So this tropical storm, soon to be hurricane, is going to get stuck in, uh, on the far western periphery of this enormous ridge over the center of the continent and this smaller but still important cutoff low to the west of California. Well, California is in, in the middle of these two things and this tropical storm looks like it's going to make a beeline for Southern California. Now I want to be really clear when I say that I think it's very unlikely that an intact tropical storm will actually make landfall in Southern California but it's not impossible. 
in this scenario. And normally I would be pretty comfortable saying it's not going to happen. Right now I'm telling you that that exact outcome probably won't happen, but uh, probably won't happen is not the same thing as it won't happen. And I, I say that pointedly because it has been a very long time since an actual intact tropical storm level tropical cyclone has made landfall anywhere in California. It was the 1930s, uh, I believe, when the last one did. Uh, the Long Beach Tropical Storm did not have a name back then. That was, as far as we understand it, an intact tropical storm that made landfall uh, in Los Angeles County. Before that, there is record of a potential hurricane that made landfall, or nearly so, so a full-fledged hurricane near San Diego. That was in 1858, I believe. Uh, please correct me on the dates if I'm mistaken. There, but there are far more instances of former or decaying tropical storms and hurricanes that did not make landfall per se in Southern California, but, but came close to doing so, dissipating offshore and producing large volumes of rain that produced severe flooding in the mountains and deserts of Southern California. So even assuming this tropical storm does not actually make landfall in California, which again, I think the odds are against it, but the odds are not zero, there is a much higher chance of major rain and flood related impacts in some parts of Southern California. Right now, it looks like the highest risk of flooding would probably be the eastern slopes of the mountains uh, in San Diego, perhaps up through Riverside counties. So these are not the western slopes that would normally receive a lot of water during a big winter storm, but these would be the eastern slopes. This is not so different from what happened with the uh, tropical storm K, which did actually come pretty close to San Diego. I believe that was just last year and resulted in major flooding, including uh, flash floods that washed out interstate bridges in the deserts of southeastern California. Right now, there are at least some uh, indications that the rain and flooding associated with this potential event could be worse than was associated with K. And that means that multiple years worth of precipitation could potentially fall in some of the driest parts of California. And by the driest parts of California, I mean the deserts of Imperial Valley uh, up through Death Valley. So these are the driest of the dry. These are places that in some years only see an inch or two of precipitation for the whole year, but which could see uh, many inches of precipitation potentially if things come together between about. So uh, the potential for a year or more's worth of precipitation over a two to three day period in the deserts uh, should ring some alarm bells about the risk of flash flooding. And there are even some model solutions suggesting that the eastern slopes of, of the mountains in places like San Diego County could see anywhere from five to 10 inches of rainfall. That would be a lot for any part of Southern California, but especially so on the drier eastern slopes that are not accustomed to seeing that level of rain. We don't know exactly the trajectory this storm is going to take, but the likelihood that these regions, these very dry parts of Southeastern California, including the imprint slopes of the mountains in Southern California, and perhaps the eastern slopes of some of the mountain ranges near Death Valley as well, could see very large amounts of precipitation during this event is rising. Same goes for far Southern Nevada, and far western uh, Arizona. So the potential for desert flash flooding is potentially very high and the level of flooding could actually be quite serious. This would not be nuisance flooding but this could potentially be the kind of flooding that causes uh, uh, damage or destruction of infrastructure and life-threatening inundation of populated areas. So we'll see how that pans out. But I want to return to the storm center itself. That flooding may occur again even if the center of the storm does not make landfall or remains well offshore. So we do not need a landfall for that to be a potential threat. But what we do also want to keep an eye out for is the possibility of a near tropical storm strength system actually be getting pretty close to the coast, uh, somewhere between about San Diego and Los Angeles County. And in recent uh, Recent predictions, both from the American and European, uh, the leading weather models in the world, both th suggest there's at least a small chance that this could uh, either make landfall or come close to doing so 
at or near tropical storm strength. It might not officially be classified as a tropical storm anymore. It might be classified as a, a post-tropical uh, storm by the National Hurricane Center. That is a possibility. But for all intents and purposes, it would be a tropical storm in terms of impact California. And that could even include the potential for strong winds. Uh, winds coming mainly out of the east and southeast. So again, from an unusual direction that will have different patterns of variability and also different damage patterns that you would get from a typical winter storm. And probably different as well from a typical strong Santa Ana event because the places that might see the strongest winds uh, would be different as well. Uh, by the way, uh, if you're on any of the islands in the California Bight, the Southern California Bight, so Catalina Island, the Channel Islands, this could be a very significant storm and a very large hazard to uh, marine traffic in the region because there could be large locally generated waves coming from a very rare direction along with strong winds and heavy rain on the islands. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with this event, but this is the first time that I can remember that the National Hurricane Center uh, five-day cone of uncertainty uh, included a California city within the tropical storm strength wind swath. Uh, I think that actually might expand even further uh, in the next couple of days. And I am quite certain that the Na National Weather Service offices in Los Angeles and San Diego uh, the LA office is, of course, in Oxnard, are having coordination calls, uh, or will be shortly, uh, with the National Hurricane Center. That doesn't happen too often. I can say that. There is uh, precedent, of course, in the past for storms that have come close but not actually made landfall. Maybe the most interesting one, uh, I believe it was Hurricane Linda back in 1997. Those of you who remember what was going on in 1997 will remember that there was a strong east-based El Nino event developing in the tropical Pacific Basin that year, exactly as there is this year. Uh, I don't think that's entirely coincidental. Uh, there is a tendency for strong east-based El Nino events to favor tropical cyclogenesis in the far eastern Pacific Ocean uh, versus other places, and also for ocean water temperatures off the coast of Baja, California, where these storms intensify to become stronger, or excuse me, to become warmer than usual. And we do see that right now. So uh, when that occurred in 1997, there was a moment where there was a serious consideration that, that Hurricane Linda, which became a very intense hurricane, might make a beeline as a rapidly weakening, but albeit still potentially a tropical storm or hurricane making landfall somewhere between San Diego and Los Angeles not entirely dissimilar from the present situation, although currently Hurricane Hillary, soon to be Hurricane Hillary, may not reach that same level of intensity. At the time, uh, to my understanding, Southern California did not have any uh, hurricane or tropical storm watch or warning breakpoints, uh, as did places along the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard, because there'd never been a need to make them before. Uh, but in the, in, in the preparation for this potential event, uh, the National Hurricane Center, I think in conjunction with the local weather service offices in California, uh, did in fact establish those for future use. So uh, if for some reason uh, there is a need for a tropical storm watch along the San Diego County coast uh, on Sunday and Monday, again, I don't think that's likely, but it's not impossible. Uh, those, uh, those plans have already uh, been put into place thanks to experience uh, a couple of decades ago. So uh, this is pretty interesting and actually is more than a novelty. Sometimes we talk about these recurving or, or, or tropical storms that can affect California as being something of a novelty. It might bring pretty clouds, scattered showers, isolated thunderstorms, but not really a big deal. The weather on Sunday and, morning, Sunday and Monday uh, has a strong potential to affect many Californians and disrupt their daily lives. Uh, that is pretty unusual for, to, for weather in, in mid-August in this part of the world. And the impacts, again, are going to depend exactly uh, on what trajectory the storm takes. There's a pretty high likelihood I'm going to have another live YouTube session, uh, perhaps sometime this weekend, right? Maybe on Saturday when it's a little bit clearer what's going to happen. I'll also have a new blog post probably on Friday or Saturday as well. So we'll be able to talk a little bit more specifics then. But a significant 
storm that will in some ways resemble a storm, it's not going to be a cold storm, uh, is likely to affect uh, s parts of Southern California uh, Sunday into Monday. And the impacts could be anything from heavy rain and high surf uh, to potentially strong winds as well. And so we're just gonna have to talk about the details later, but right now, uh, the, aside from the usual travel disruptions and hazardous marine conditions, my biggest concern would be regarding the potential for major flash flooding uh, on the eastern slopes of the Southern California mountains and the desert uh, regions, including some of the driest parts of the desert regions in both Southeastern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. Depending on the track this system takes, it could also bring widespread rainfall to parts of Central and Northern California on Monday into Tuesday. So the active weather pattern up north would continue. That actually could be good news up north, given the wildfire situation right now, uh, where these would be uh, potentially uh, rather rainy uh, days in Northern California if certain uh, trajectories for the potential trajectories for this storm actually pan out. And we might accomplish that without a great deal of additional lightning. So that actually could be helpful from uh, a wildfire perspective, but could be preceded by unusual easterly wind patterns, though. Uh, so this is something to, be, to keep an eye on as well. Depending on the, tra the trajectory of this storm, Northern California could see anything from a very beneficial light to moderate rain pattern without a whole lot of lightning. That would be the best case scenario. Uh, there could be a scenario where there is only patchy rainfall with more lightning in the mix, or it could remain uh, largely dry, uh, cloudy, and then windy, uh, which would probably be the worst case uh, outcome from a fire perspective because you would get those winds potentially pushing uh, some of these recent lightning ignitions uh, in fairly uh, strongly in, and in erratic directions. So that's going to be something to watch in Northern California as well uh, as the system evolves. But again, those impacts, pretty wide range of impacts, and it's going to depend on exactly the path this system takes. So just to summarize what's going, what's going on with uh, Hillary, currently a tropical storm, likely to become a hurricane, and very plausibly a major hurricane, potentially becoming a Category 3 or stronger storm. Uh, uh, over uh, the next couple of days, oops. Well, it looks like something has broken again. So let me see here. All right, it looks like I am back up. All right, good. Um, I'll have to double check as well to see if some of these errors are uh, on my end, but clearly earlier today it was uh, on everyone's end. Uh, looks like the lag has also cleaned up a little bit. All right, so just to resummarize, uh, Hillary is currently a tropical storm expected to strengthen uh, into hurricane status over the next day or two, eventually becoming a major hurricane, category three or stronger, uh, before it rapidly weakens uh, uh, as it approaches California, but perhaps, perhaps uh, not weakening b below tropical storm strength before it makes a very close pass on the Southern California coast sometime Sunday or Monday. And whether or not it actually does make that very close approach or whether it's a more distant one, the risk of very heavy rainfall and serious flash flooding in some parts of the interior of Southern California, especially mountains, the eastern slopes, and the deserts, uh, is a significant uh, threat either way. And that is likely to be the most potentially damaging and life-threatening aspect of this event, although that could change depending on the exact trajectory of the storm. So again, there will be a lot of rumors swirling. There'll be a lot of communication about this, a lot of uh, misleading weather maps posted on social media. But that said, this does have the potential to be a pretty big deal uh, as far as summer weather events go. And it has the potential to be a big deal in places in California that don't normally see a lot of water. And that is one of the reasons why it's concerning. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. There's a slight chance that Southern California could see its first landfalling tropical system in uh, 
nearly a century. I still think that's not the likeliest outcome, but I'd say there's at least a 10 or 20% chance that that happens. Uh, so not negligible. And regardless, I would expect significant rain, wind, and surf impacts, even assuming it doesn't actually make landfall as an intact tropical or post-tropical system. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about why California doesn't see more uh, tropical storms or hurricanes, despite its relatively low latitude. Uh, for example, the same latitude on the east coast of the U.S., you have considerable risk of hurricanes. And the reason that most folks are familiar with is, of course, the water temperatures, the ocean temperatures, uh, warm water is essentially hurricane fuel, are much cooler off the west coast at this equivalent latitude than they are off of the east coast because of the cold currents and the upwelling along the California coast. The water temperature off the coast of San Francisco uh, is often uh, in the 50s this time of year, so uh, better chance of hypothermia than a hurricane, uh, but the water temperature off the coast uh, of, say, the Carolinas can easily be in the 70s and 80s Fahrenheit, so that's a very large difference. The water in parts of the Southern California Bight, uh, and in particular right near shore, so off the Santa Monica Pier, the Scripps Pier, places like that, can sometimes get up into the 70s, even approaching 80 degrees Fahrenheit at its absolute warmest. It isn't that warm right now, it's certainly warmer than the water off of San Francisco, but it's still nowhere near warm enough to support uh, uh, the tropical cyclogenesis, which is a fancy way of saying hurricane development. So one of the reasons why California doesn't really see active hurricanes making landfall, uh, for almost always, is because water temperatures are nowhere near warm enough to support either the development of a hurricane that forms somewhere else and uh, had a trajectory toward California. But there are actually two other key reasons. One is that the level of atmospheric moisture in the atmosphere well above the surface is very low. So there's the marine layer, of course, you can get fog near the coast, and clearly there's plenty of moisture there. But above that level, above that marine inversion, there's usually not a whole lot of water vapor in the atmosphere uh, over California in the summer months. And part of that is because of uh, C, the third reason, which is the fact that California uh, is in a region of profound subtropical subsidence. Subsidence meaning downward movement of the atmosphere. Uh, generally, you need upward motion in the atmosphere to support the development of clouds, the kinds of deep tropical thunderstorm clouds that start swirling and eventually become a hurricane if they can form over warm enough waters in the absence of wind shear. So in California we have almost none of the factors that you would need to develop hurricanes. You don't have warm enough water, you don't have enough atmospheric water vapor, you don't have enough upward motion in the atmosphere or atmospheric instability to support tropical like thunderstorms. So how the heck can we get into a situation like this one? Well, there's really one possible, uh, there's one possible weakness uh, in that uh, typical trifecta that sometimes allows these systems to sneak through, uh, is that if a strong enough hurricane can develop off the coast of Baja California, where water temperatures are much warmer and more favorable for tropical cyclogenesis, and if an unusual atmospheric flow pattern, like the one that's going to be in place this weekend, can steer that unusually strong hurricane directly north or northwestward, as is expected to be the case later this week, essentially one of these tropical storms, despite itself, despite its wanting to fall apart, uh, can maintain some semblance of tropical storm storminess uh, before it completely falls apart and make it all the way to California. So the storm has to make a beeline, and it will be rapidly weakening, yet, yet it might still have tropical storm-like effects. And that is almost certainly what happened uh, with the Long Beach tropical cyclone, uh, tropical storm back in the 1930s. It's what likely happened with the 1858 San Diego hurricane. And it is definitely what has happened with the, any number of tech, not technically non-landfalling but still high impact tropical remnant events in Southern California in recent decades. So that is sort of the mechanism. The loophole is that if you get a big enough, strong enough hurricane that moves fast enough it doesn't have time to completely fall apart before reaching California. That's the 
conceptual model for how this would happen, and it's exactly what the models are suggesting uh, what might happen this weekend. It won't be a healthy storm. It'll, it'll look pretty raggedy. There may not even be a whole lot of deep convection left uh, near the core of the storm, the deep convection, these deep tropical uh, cumulus congestus and thunderstorm cumulonimbus clouds that maintain uh, the strength of the storm and help spin it up will be falling apart by the time they get to Southern California, but perhaps not quite fast enough to avoid some significant impacts. So this situation is exactly the kind of scenario where you would expect this would rarely occur. So it's a rare scenario, but it makes sense. And everything looks like it's shaping up with this big persistent blocking ridge of high pressure across the center of the country uh, and this cutoff low off the coast of California to produce what could be a memorable and high impact midsummer weather event uh, centered across Southern California, but potentially also affecting uh, more northern parts of the state as well as adjacent states. Woo. That's a lot all at once. Let me just take a sip of water for a moment. So I realize I haven't taken that many questions today. There's been so much to get through and so much technical uh, difficulty. I do want to uh, at least skim through these. Uh, so uh, let me just make sure that I have set everything up in a way. Let's see here. All right, just for those who probably joined late or weren't able to join for a while and were wondering what the heck was going on, I had major technical difficulties. Uh, at this point, I believe it is probably uh, my computer rather than the internet connection, so I am going to have to work on that. Uh, unfortunately for this weekend, I, I think I'm kind of stuck with the hardware that I have, so I'll try and optimize it as much as I can. Still looking for folks who actively know how to troubleshoot live stream OBS hardware issues, please do reach out directly, making that plea once again. But I think ultimately what seems likely is that I just need to get a new uh, a new system uh, if I'm going to be doing these live streams. And I think, you know, I, I, do, I do think these are really productive because, uh, well, uh, despite the incredible technical difficulties earlier, there's still almost 300 people watching, and I know a lot more people will watch later. So thanks again for your patience. All right, so I'm going to go back in the in the list and see if I can answer some questions. Uh, let's see here. All right, I'm just apologies for the the brief gap. I'm just scrolling down because there are uh, a lot of a lot of comments, more than questions so far. Uh, feel free to now add them because I am going to see them momentarily once I get down to the bottom. Uh, of the of the live chat. A question from Allison about how much could the recent thunderstorms and historic heat worsen what's been a relatively quiet fire season in the West? Uh, yes, it already is, and particularly in the Pacific Northwest and far northern California. So there's some pretty serious fires going on now. Uh, all the way from the Northwest Territory, where a significant fraction of the population, by the way, of the Northwest Territories of Canada have been evacuated or will be evacuated shortly. So there is an ongoing wildfire emergency in the Northwest Territories of Canada on fire. Again, having experienced its hottest day on record, I believe today, actually just before I logged in, its hottest August day on record uh, had just occurred. So, and Washington and Oregon are both experiencing large forest fires. And now as well, the northern third of California, a bunch of new lightning fires. So yes, with the additional hot weather to come, I think these are going to continue uh, to escalate. The one caveat silver lining uh, is that if uh, the uh, tr for former tropical storm uh, Hillary by that point, uh, the remnant moisture makes it far enough north that it might actually help out up there uh, but if it doesn't, it might just produce some weird wind patterns and maybe some additional lightning while keeping things uh, warmer than usual because there won't be a lot of storm activity otherwise. So uh, I think right now we've entered a much more active wild quiet, but the western states, the west coast states and Canadian province uh, are rapidly ratcheting up that level of activity right now. Uh, so, uh, 
Someone mentions uh, weather uh, 753 mentions that it looks like LA could see an inch or two of rain from Hillary with high uncertainty. That would be their second wettest uh, August on record, be behind 1977. I believe you. That sounds about right. What is interesting is that the range in outcomes for how much rain could fall in and around LA from this event range from about a quarter inch, so nothing too remarkable, although, you know, it is notable when it rains measurably at all in August in LA, to five or six inches of rain this weekend which would be absolutely historic uh, in the context of any August rain event uh, in history in that part of the state. So wide range of outcomes, it probably is going to rain in Southern California Sunday and Monday. So uh, that, that is a pretty solid prediction. But whether it's relatively modest rain or just an unbelievable deluge remains to be seen, and both of those possibilities are on the table. All right here, continuing to scroll down, please bear with me, there's about 300 comments, so I'm going as fast as I can. A question from Noah Hughes, is there any good reason to believe that our changing climate might bring more tropical system to California's doorstep over the coming decades? I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, and the answer nominally, I think, is yes, but to perhaps a limited extent. So it's been rare historically, and it will probably still be pretty rare in the future, but maybe somewhat less so. And the reason for that fits in with these three inhibitors I mentioned earlier. Uh, the ocean temperatures are just far too cold, uh, there's not enough atmospheric moisture, and there's not enough vertical motion or instability in the atmosphere to support or maintain tropical cyclones in their development or maintenance of strength near California. One of those, at least, one of those constraints will weaken. The, the ocean temperature constraint will weaken as ocean temperatures warm. So that will become slightly less of a constraint. There's no way that Southern California waters are going to warm more high enough to support the development of tropical cyclones, but the water off the coast of Baja, California, will possibly warm enough to be less effective at killing them off if they do form and have this northward trajectory. So events like this might become a bit more common and the, uh, the very rare possibility of an actual hurricane making it to somewhere near San Diego perhaps becomes slightly less unlikely, slightly less rare than it would have been in the past century or so. so it's a little less clear if any other atmospheric variables might might become more favorable. We actually expect that the subtropical uh, subsidence effect could even increase, so that would further inhibit vertical development. But on the other hand, the level of uh, instability in atmospheric moisture could increase slightly according to some predictions as well. So I guess we could call that a wash, and the one factor that sort of stands out as uh, increasing ocean temperatures, particularly during strong El Nino events, get us slightly less far away from the threshold that would be required to maintain tropical cyclones, and so I think it would be plausible that we'd see somewhat less weakening, potentially, of those that do take this type of trajectory, and potentially see, that, see these sorts of events happen a little bit more often. But the reality is, and I've looked, I don't think anybody's ever actually studied this formally in a scientific or academic context. So we don't actually know. This is sort of me spitballing. And it would be interesting to ask that question more formally, since I suspect that there probably is some signal, but we can't detect it in historical trends, since it's going to be you know, much weaker than natural variability, because it's already something that's highly sporadic, uh, and you need the exact right convergence of events. But is there a theoretical possibility that it could? Yes. Do I think that, you know, we're going to see a Sharknado in Los Angeles? I think that was actually the plot line of that movie, is that global warming made hurricanes more likely in L.A., which, again, uh, not likely to happen uh, at face value, but there perhaps is a, a very minor kernel of truth in there regarding these sorts of uh, exceptional events where the, these systems take rapid northward trajectories and don't have time to completely weaken before getting here. Maybe that... Uh, is slightly less unlikely in the future. All right, continuing to scroll down. 
Yeah, there's a remark that a hurricane from Chris Hansen that Hurricane K uh, last year caused wind gusts of 109 miles an hour in the San Diego County Mountains. They, they caused some significant damage. Um, there could be similar or perhaps even slightly stronger winds in this event and slightly more widespread winds depending on the trajectory. If this system maintains near, near uh, tropical storm or tropical storm strength equivalent to a latitude of San Diego and takes a close approach on San Diego County, we could see winds like that again and perhaps even stronger ones. So, uh, you know, it, your mileage is really going to vary depending on the exact trajectory. There's going to be major interactions with the mountains and the orographics. So uh, I wouldn't take the model predicted wind values uh, at face value. They're not going to adequately resolve local enhancements or diminutions of wind speed. I would expect that many places in the mountains would see much higher winds than the models indicate, and some areas uh, near the coast could potentially see weaker winds than the models indicate. But again, that really is going to depend on the trajectory. And if for some reason the core of a tropical storm strength system uh, does actually get close to the coast in Southern California, you could potentially see tropical storm strength winds somewhere along the coast in San Diego, Orange, or LA counties. Uh, and the gusty winds, by the way, they could extend all the way up uh, into Santa Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, depending on the trajectory. So uh, this could actually be a storm that hits the, again, I mentioned the Channel Islands, Avalon, pretty hard. Uh, certainly uh, in an unusual direction with unusual wind and wave patterns for August. Uh, a question from Rebecca uh, Stebbins. Uh, wasn't there major flooding in Death Valley a year ago? Yes, Death Valley has actually seen a number of major flood events in recent years, and there could be yet another one within the week. So if you have plans to go there, if you have plans to go to the Imperial Valley, if you have plans to be on, in the San Diego County Mountains, pay close attention to these forecasts, because this is going to be a major event. Uh, question from Chris Hansen. This confirms that there has never been a tropical storm watch or warning in California. I believe the answer to that is no. I don't know what event there would ever have been one for. It, it almost happened uh, with Linda in 97, but then it, the storm did not ultimately uh, come that close to California. So I don't believe there ever has been a formal tropical storm or hurricane watch or warning issued by the National Hurricane Center for any part of the west coast of the United States. Um, there have been in Hawaii, but of course that's a quite a different story. So in California North, uh, that has never happened. So if it happens, and again, I would peg that as maybe a 10 to 20 percent chance right now. So there's a 90, 80 to 90 percent chance that that won't happen even with this system. But you know, again, small but not negligible chance. It would be the first time, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, question from Travis, will this bring wind to the northern parts of the state, specifically the areas that were hit with the recent lightning, presumably worried about the risk of um, unusual wind patterns blowing up uh, existing wildfire ignitions? Possibly. I don't think it's going to be a major windstorm, but there might be some winds out of unusual directions, and we will have to see exactly where the center of circulation goes, because I have seen uh, low likelihood, a, a couple of members from the broader ensemble that would bring stronger winds to Northern California. They might bring stronger winds and some rain, though, which would be a mitigating factor. So we'll have to see. Uh, that's something I probably would want to talk about more this weekend once it's clearer what the trajectory is going to be. All right, as a bunch of folks asking me what the statistics for record rainfall are in various places, uh, as much as I wish that I had an encyclopedic memory, I do not. So I, I would have to look those up uh, and other folks can probably do that just as easily as I can. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave, leave that as an exercise to the reader. If anybody ever uh, had some fun in atmospheric dynamics or calculus classes, you'll know that that's a bit of an inside joke when the author doesn't really want to go <laughs> through the hard part uh, in the text. Uh, let's see. Let's see what else there is here. Uh, a question from Mark. Given the forecast track, isn't this a situation where minor east to west deviations in the path might have large influences in the areas re receiving wind and rain? Absolutely yes. 
The only place where I would expect to see heavy rain to some extent, no matter what, are the eastern slopes of the mountains of Southern California, particularly San Diego County. That's just a reality. When you get deep southeasterly, moist, unstable flow, you're going to get some significant rainfall there. So uh, that's the one place I think that's likely to see significant impacts in almost any scenario. But everywhere else, yes, uh, the exact trajectories of 50 to 100 miles make a big difference on who and whether uh, whether there are major impacts and who sees them. There's a comment from uh, KMUD News, um, probably KMUD, but I'm not personally familiar, so apologies if I got that wrong. Uh, a comment that today uh, in Del Norte County, uh, uh, which is indeed the whitest county in the state on average, uh, has sustained the worst of the lightning strikes and the lightning strike fires. Uh, and as is mentioned, uh, the activity on those fires is not yet really anything to compare to the more active and even explosive uh, head fire, as it's been named uh, yesterday, but nearing there's um, on fire in Del Norte. So that's not, you know, that's not negligible. And that's an area that has seen less fire activity uh, in some recent years. So I think there are fewer recent burn areas um, that might act as uh, stop gaps there. So there has broadly been, and, and I actually, I haven't, uh, I'm almost, I'm not going to open up the radar on my computer right now for fear of crashing the live stream, but I'm opening it up just on, uh, just on my phone to take a quick look. Um, once I figure out the technical support and perhaps get a new laptop, I'll be able to open these during the live stream and show you what I'm looking at. Uh, but right now, alas, I think I better not tempt fate. Uh, yeah, and I'm, what I'm seeing right now is, um, yep, there are more downstrikes right now in interior Mendocino and Trinity counties as well as Shasta County. So more new storms blowing up there. I wouldn't be too surprised if those became more widespread in Mendocino, Lake counties later, and maybe even Sonoma, Napa counties heading closer to the Bay Area too, uh, down in that direction. So we'll see what happens later this evening uh, with that. Plenty of lightning along the crest and the western slopes of the Sierra uh, again today. That's a little bit less unusual, but nonetheless has resulted in some new ignitions as well. All right. So uh, a comment from Bill Locke uh, that the Weather Channel is forecasting 8 to 12 inches of rain in the mountains east of, well, San Francisco uh, and L.A. by Tuesday. I think that might be a slightly overbroad characterization, but could there be 8 to 12 inches of rain in the, on the eastern slopes of some of the mountains in Southern California uh, from some of the wetter scenarios? Uh, should they come to pass? That is a possibility. And that is why uh, there is so much concern regarding the potential for m much more than just minor nuisance flooding uh, on the eastern slopes of the Southern California mountains and the deserts, because of course these are places that in some in some cases only see between three and ten inches of rain in a typical year. So this would be potentially greater than the average annual rainfall in two or three days, uh, and so that obviously has the potential to, be, to cause some big problems. All right, so I'm getting about two-thirds of the way through the comments. Yeah, a comment from Gene on the technical side, um, first buffering in a long time. I'm glad this has mostly held together, uh, at least it's been intelligible for the most part since the original problem. CPU usage, I agree, I think that's the problem, and unfortunately it's because my CPU, I have nothing else open. It is literally just the streaming software, it's the computer, it's too old. I need a better machine. Um, a question from Noah that I think I answered. Is there any good reason to believe that our changing climate might bring more tropical systems to the door, to California's doorstep? Maybe, probably not a huge change, but there, there might be reason, theoretical reason to believe at least that there could be a slight uptick. Um, Yeah, there's a comment from Laurie about the developing very strong El Nino and implications for California winter. I will, of course, be talking about that later, but as it is, there's just a heck of, heck of a lot going on and uh, too much going on to talk about that right now, today. There are only so many hours in the day. 
as much as I wish that were not the case. Uh, let's see. Oh, a comment, a comment uh, from Zep. Uh, apparently they stopped uh, forward spread on the head fire, which is about 35 miles west of Wairika. Uh, it's around 3,000 acres, a little under that. Um, and as has been pointed out, yes, conditions are, this isn't 2020. The antecedents aren't the same. We aren't coming off the heels of a severe drought and experiencing a record hot summer in California. And so I think one of the lessons here is that those antecedents do matter. It's not completely random why some fire seasons are really bad and why some are milder. Uh, it really does matter how warm and how dry things were leading into things. And this year was, again, an unusually wet and cruel start to the season. That has helped. It doesn't mean that there are no fires. It doesn't mean there can't be lightning ignitions. But it does mean that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure if, uh, if, if the wildfire folks are still on the call, they'll, they'll, they'll probably be nodding. You know, if, if, this thing, if, the, if the cool side and the damp side of these slopes are still uh, have some green grass or still have some in, in other cases, but once the winds die down, you know, unless you have truly exceptional dryness of vegetation and warmth, you know, these fires do slow down as they start to, to move back downhill, uh, except under extraordinary conditions. And right now, the, the vegetation dryness, the antecedents are not that extraordinary. So this is one of the reasons, by the way, why climate change matters when it comes to wildfire in California. These days, we're seeing a lot more extraordinary conditions on the dry and hot side. This year has not been necessarily one of those years, so we've sort of had a throwback year to the way things used to be more often. And you know, we're to some extent, we're seeing the benefits of that. I wish there were more uh, good fire and prescribed fire on the ground this year, given given the opportunities we've had these last six months. But at least it does mean that this year, not every fire is taking off in a, in a destructive and dangerous way. And we are seeing a lot more fires behaving, you know, as they do under less extreme burning conditions. So doesn't mean that the, none of these lightning fires are going to be a problem. Some of them very well could be. There could be additional ones uh, in the coming days. But this is not 2020 so far, and I don't really think it's likely to become uh, anywhere near that level of severity in terms of the both the number and the, the seriousness of the lightning conditions that do occur. I know this is, the I guess, the third anniversary, essentially, of the 2020 August lightning event, and that one was focused on areas that were pretty populated. So one of the other challenges with this event is there were a lot of strikes and a lot of fires in really bad locations in the middle of a really, really dry, hot summer. Uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, the no mountains of the North Bay, among other regions, these are bad places to have fires under exceptionally historically dry conditions, and we did see what the consequences of that uh, were back then. Uh, fortunately, that I, I, right now, even though there could be some lightning and lightning conditions in some of those same regions in the next couple of days, I do not expect to see nearly as many, and I don't expect the fires that do result to behave nearly as aggressively, just given the reality of where we are right now with the antecedent conditions. All right, looking, uh, continuing down the the, the live chat getting close to the end now. Yes, the all important question, what are the odds of a Sharknado in San Diego this weekend or on Monday? Well, um, above average, let's just say, um, I guess, I guess the, the presence of a tropical cyclone makes it, uh, a little, a little less unlikely than, than the usual background odds of Sharknado. Uh, just to be clear, I'm joking. All right, let's see here. Uh, oh, this is a good question uh, from Rob. How different would a tropical storm impact from be from a regular winter storm in Southern California? In some ways, it would resemble a strong winter storm. So. But the problem is that the regions that would receive the strongest winds and heaviest rains would be different. 
So the areas that are accustomed to heavy rains in winter would not necessarily be the same places that we get the heaviest rains during a tropical cyclone event. And the winds would be coming from a completely different direction and might again affect different areas. So overall, uh, and, you know, and the magnitude of the most intense precipitation could potentially be higher, especially again in the eastern slopes and in desert regions. So in some ways it would kind of feel like a, a, a weirdly warm winter storm. So imagine a winter storm with temperatures in the 60s and 70s. That's kind of what it might feel like on Sunday and Monday. Uh, that definitely puts us in the uh, uncanny valley of, of meteorology in some ways. You know, when you're in a place where you have uh, mainly cool season rain, it is pretty weird to, to get uh, significant stormy weather when it's not cold or even cool out, where it's actually muggy and sticky and you can potentially go out in shorts and a raincoat. That's kind of an unusual experience. Uh, and so it will feel different. Uh, the other thing is that uh, some of the wind impacts can be a bit different because the vegetation is in a different state. So in winter, deciduous trees, obviously, they don't have their leaves on. Right now, everything is the full foliage. So a major wind event in places with uh, deciduous trees would probably have a lot more tree damage uh, than you would uh, during a winter uh, storm. So that's another consideration. And also, the swells, the ocean conditions are going to be potentially... Uh, uh, will will be more ener not necessarily more energetic, uh, but they'll be coming from a different direction. Uh, and again, you know, the the coastal infrastructure is largely built to deal with swells coming from the typical prevailing directions, and so that could actually result potentially in significant coastal uh, harbor pier type damage if we do get uh, one of the closer passes along the range of things as possible. So, in some ways. It'll feel familiar, but a little bit warmer. In other ways, it actually could be qualitatively different. And so, again, it'll depend a little bit on the trajectory. That's kind of my thoughts for now. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, as mentioned, several folks have asked about El Nino. I will talk about it. It's not the most urgent thing at the moment, so I will talk about it in a future conversation. Um, let's see here. Sometimes the, the live chat uh, jumps around a bit as I scroll down. I'm almost done here. Yeah, just uh, I've covered this already, but since I, other people might have this question, I'll just reiterate. Have there been any research studies on the impacts of tropical cyclones in California as a result of climate change? Uh, could a genuine impact turn from a once in a like a 200 year event to maybe a 30 or 40 year event? That's not an unreasonable hypothesis. We don't really know. Nobody has done any formal research on this to my knowledge. There are Theoretical reasons to expect at least a slight increase in the odds, but probably not an enormous increase because, you know, we have, as I mentioned, these three big constraints on why we don't have them here. The ocean's too cold. The atmosphere is too stable. There's not enough moisture. The only thing that I would really expect to maybe shift in a more favorable direction would be the ocean will be warmer, especially uh, off of Southern California and, more importantly, off of Baja California where these storms intensify. So that part may become a little bit less of a constraint we're still going to have the other two constraints, stable, subtropical, subsidence atmosphere, and activity. So stay tuned. Maybe somebody will actually write that paper now that there's been a couple more near misses in recent years in California. Uh, might the storm be uh, serious enough to cause airport closures at LAX or San Diego? Uh, it's hard to, it depends on the exact trajectory. There's at least a possibility, it's probably more likely at San Diego. And even if there aren't closures, there could be substantial weather delays. Uh, but that is a possibility. So air, air travel and road travel, uh, and even train travel, because of course, uh, Amtrak runs right along the coast that has already been having major coastal erosion issues. This could be, you know, the kind of storm that uh, causes uh, sudden erosion. So. 
uh, travel disruptions are very possible uh, between late Saturday and maybe early Tuesday, especially in Southern California. Let's see here. Oh, and uh, yeah, you know, maybe I did miss this uh, back on the interrupted portion of the stream. Somebody mentioned uh, that Jesse just, just reminded, I, I guess there were some questions about, um, and this is, this is maybe a good way to close and to sort of tie some things together, uh, about the risk of like a, a Maui-like downslope windstorm prior to the arrival of a tropical system in California. One of the things that may have contributed to the magnitude of the, the firestorm on Maui was very, very violent downslope windstorm. I, I would estimate wind gusts were probably above 80 miles an hour. There's no official instrumentation there, either even before the fire, so we won't know for sure, but that's that seems pretty likely. Um, most of that was contributed by an unusually high pressure in the atmosphere to the north of the Hawaiian Islands, but there may have also been some indirect contribution from uh, a relatively distant Hurricane Dora to the south of the islands. The exact contribution remains to be seen, but we do know that on the subsident northern flank of some tropical systems, you can get uh, very dry air and favorable conditions for if there is mountainous topography in the place where the winds are blowing uh, from east to west, uh, the potential for, potential for downslope windstorms. That general geographic configuration is somewhat similar to the coastal mountains in Southern California because you'd have a tropical storm to the west, uh, mountains to the east, inland, and east to west flow, so downslope flow. Uh, we did see a little bit of that during uh, the K last summer. Uh, it briefly pumped up some active wildfires at the time, but it rained shortly thereafter and that really severely mitigated, fortunately. In this case, there might actually be enough moisture around prior to the arrival of winds to get things a bit damp before the winds start, so that would really mitigate that risk. But it is something I would keep an eye on locally. Uh, we will have to keep an eye out for localized instances of, of fire weather concerns as this system moves closer to the coast and before the rain starts. So that is something to keep an eye out for. It's really too early to say because it depends both how strong do the winds become and what is the sequencing of any rain prior to the wind. So if there's a window where there's strong winds before the rains arrive, yes, that could be a concern. Uh, so I think it's worth considering. I'll talk about it this weekend in the follow-up live session and blog post if it is in fact a concern a lesser version of that as well in Northern California. So I do not expect a severe windstorm in Northern California by any means, but could there be some weak to moderate offshore flow that's kind of aseasonal for mid-August? Potentially that, that could be in the cards. So I'll talk about that too if it looks like it's going to happen. Alright, well, uh, I think uh, I think that's, I'm going to call it quits. Uh, this has been a very long session, but I think hopefully a productive one. Again, I apologize for the tech problems uh, in the beginning. Um, still looking for any specific advice. Please do email me if you have that. Uh, if you have that. I probably am going to have to be in the market for a new uh, a new computer in the coming weeks and months. Uh, once I can budget for that, so I will also take suggestions for what uh, what computers, uh, what specs might be good for live streaming specifically, since this was a very good computer in 2018, but 2018, I mean, that feels like a lifetime ago. Think of everything that's happened since then, so I realize that's no longer a, that's no, that's no longer a spring chicken device. That's for sure. Um, anyway, I, uh, I won't have a new one by this weekend, so I'm going to try and tweak as many settings as I can so that this weekend's live stream goes as smoothly as possible. If it doesn't, just know that I'm doing the best that I can with pretty limited resources. Uh, I don't have any technical team. I don't have any experience with broadcasting. It's just me, uh, my scientific background, and my computer uh, in the spare bedroom that has become the home office where we have rewired uh, hope, I was hoping that would solve the problem, 
it did not. But perhaps it means that when I do get a better computer, uh, the internet connection will just be amazing because it's all brand new cabling. So maybe that's the silver lining there. All right, everybody, uh, thank you. And uh, I will talk to you uh, probably uh, in just a few days. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have another live stream sometime between Friday and Sunday along with a new blog post. So keep an eye out for that, and I'll announce it in the usual places. Thanks again for listening and for your patience, and uh, see you next time.